My name is Jonathan Veach, and I am the president of Occidental College, and I'd like to welcome you to Los Angeles and to our campus today for this public li listening se session on America's Great Outdoors. We are pleased to have with us Lisa Jackson, Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Ken Salazar, Secretary of the Department of the Interior, Nancy Sutley, Chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, Harris, uh, Harris Sherman, Undersecretary for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Joe Ellen Darcy, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. We are delighted to have our distinguished cabinet members here and officials here with us in the same hall where President Obama sat as a student in this audience. I want to thank all of you, uh, all this. I want to thank all of the staff from the Environmental Protection Agency, Mayor Via Ragosa's office, Occidental professors Martha Matsuoka, Bob Gottlieb, and our Urban Environmental Policy Institute, who helped pull together this event. We are enormously pleased to host it here at Occidental. So why do we think Los Angeles is such a good place to provide feedback on America's Great Outdoors initiative, and what makes it compelling to, for us to have it here at Occidental College? Los Angeles has a reputation as one of the most environmentally challenged cities in the nation, the capital of sprawl, the city where everybody drives and nobody walks. But Los Angeles is also a great city of imagination, a land of magical improvisation, as the great writer Kerry McWilliams once put it. As one of the very sm few small liberal arts colleges in America located in the world's mega cities, Occidental is the perfect place to host an event that brings together urban life and the great outdoors. Our students and faculty are committed to the development of sound public policy through community engagement and civic dialogue. And with the help of Professors Peter Dreyer, Martha Matsuoka, and under Bob Gottlieb's direction, the Urban Environmental Policy Institute, or UEPI, has been the engine for Occidental's uh, efforts for innovative programs. One of my first introductions to Oxy was the Arroyo Fest, hosted by UEPI five years ago. In an effort to reclaim the city streets, the Arroyo Fest worked with Caltrans to shut down the Pasadena Freeway so that city residents could ride bicycles and walk on lanes where traffic usually moves at 50 miles an hour. It was an extraordinary moment in which Angelinos reclaimed the, envir the built environment and reduced it to a sustainable human scale. For the first time in decades, the sound of water could be heard above the roar of traffic, reminding people of the remarkable appeal of this beautiful part of the city that once drew artists and intellectuals to its banks and resulted in beautiful, the beautiful craftsmen bungalows that are still with us today. The Arroyo remains one of Northeast Los Angeles' great and underutilized resources, and we look forward to the results of this initiative in restoring its prominence. Occidental has been involved with many similar efforts to reclaim our natural environment. Uh, among them, we are moving forward with plans to build a one megawatt solar array here on campus, which will provide 12% of the college's energy needs. And I think, uh, most interestingly, we intend to configure it as a piece of land art. And when it is installed, it will be one of the first such solar arrays in Los Angeles. Occidental has also been in the forefront of creating a farm to schools program that works on nutrition with middle schoolers, connects them to small farms in the Central Valley, and reduces transportation uh, distances, uh, thereby uh, uh, aiding all three constituencies. Occidental has also been a part of the effort to reclaim the Los Angeles River. This movement, led by poets and activists, have, has become an inspiration to urban river and stream advocates around the country. The change that has happened around the LA River, despite the numerous barriers posed by its 70-year-long history as a concrete channel, is palpable. And now that it is officially navigable, I hope you, I can join all of you to not only come down to the river, as Lewis McAdams has been telling us for 25 years, but to kayak the river, sit by its banks, and envision its future. Finally, we at Occidental think about Los Angeles as the great outdoors, a place where we live and work, 
We appreciate and celebrate all the numerous efforts to heal the bay, to value and protect our watersheds, to plant an urban forest, and to create a model of urban conservancy. We are grateful for an urban public land trust that values all our outdoor spaces, big and small, whether inner city pocket parks, former rail yards turned into green and open spaces, or majestic places like Griffith Park, the Santa Monica, and the San Gabriel Mountains. We feel there is no better place than here at Occidental College in Los Angeles, where many of us are dedicated to a vision of Los Angeles reinvented and transformed to continue the discussion about the vision of America's great outdoors. Now, before I leave the podium, I want to say a few words about our next speaker, Los Angeles Mayor Villaraigosa. A native of Los Angeles, Antonio Villaraigosa grew up on the east side, not very far from this campus. In recognition of his distinguished record of public service and to officially claim him as one of our own, Occidental pre presented Mayor Villaraigosa with an honorary degree in 2006. The mayor has already made great strides in his dream of making Los Angeles one of the greenest cities in the country. It is my great pleasure to have you, Mayor Villaraigosa, in, to have you introduce the listening session and to share with us once again your vision of not only what Los Angeles is, but what it can become. Welcome. Good afternoon. It's great to be here once again at Occidental, uh, a college campus that I'm more than familiar with. I, I have spoken here on many occasions. I represented this area uh, since 1994 in the State Assembly as Speaker of the Assembly, as a Council Member, uh, and now as Mayor. And I'll tell you, uh, there, this is not the first time uh, we have brought dignitaries to this campus. Uh, this campus is without question uh, one of the best colleges anywhere in the country and one that understands the importance of praxis, of working on theory, but also being involved in the community. And I want to acknowledge all of you here today. Give yourselves a big hand, the students, the administrators. And as many times as I've been here, I dare say, I've been uh, an, an assembly member, majority leader, speaker, council member, mayor. I have never been anywhere where so many uh, federal leaders cabinet secretaries, leaders of major federal agencies here gathered together for a listening session and the way we have them today. And let me just say, as I said a few times now, uh, a couple of you have heard it, uh, what a difference an election makes uh, because <laughs> I can tell you that uh, two years ago, this would not have been possible, it would not have been fathomable, it would not have happened. Uh, and the, the fact that we have the EPA Administrator, uh, Lisa Jackson here, the Secretary of Interior, Ken Salazar, our own Council on it, Chair of uh, the Council on Environmental Quality, Nancy Sutley, uh, the Under Secretary for Agriculture, Harris Sherman and the U.S. Corps of Engineers Assistant Secretary Joanne Darcy is an indication, uh, a manifestation, a direct uh, realization uh, that change is in the air, it's in the wind, it's in the environment, it's in our rivers, it's everywhere, and we couldn't be happier uh, to host you here today. Thank you so much for coming and giving them a big hand. I've known a number of these individuals for some time. I, I joke with Nancy, who used to be my deputy mayor uh, for energy and the environment, uh, that when I'm finished as mayor, I'll come and work for her, uh, because that's the way it works. And I couldn't be prouder to be here with these individuals, here to listen uh, to all of you. You know, uh, back uh, during my days in the legislature, uh, I challenged a few in the environmental community who at the time uh, on the issue of parks and open space thought that state parks uh, had some kind of birthright to the areas uh, in the suburbs and in the rural areas of the state. And historically, Southern California and particularly cities uh, and the urban core of the city had historically not participated. And I coined 
uh, a phrase that became a mantra, that became a principle uh, for funding parks in our state, and, and, and that was this. We're gonna put parks where people are. Uh, we're gonna celebrate green space uh, in the communities and in the neighborhoods that don't enjoy it. And I can tell you that back then, there were people like Lewis McAdams, and I know, is Lewis here? Lewis is right over there. I like acknowledging Lewis McAdams because Lewis McAdams, yes. <laughs> Lewis, everybody is a friend of the Alley River today. Uh, but back when uh, you and a few of you uh, were knocking on my door, a brand new uh, assembly member uh, in 1994, uh, sharing with me and with our community the dream of revitalizing a river and, and essentially making true uh, the Olmsted brothers' vision uh, for an emerald necklace of parks and open space that connects a city together. Uh, most of us thought you were crazy. <laughs> and uh, I remember people telling me, why are you meeting with him? Uh, so much. And over time, uh, the crazy man became uh, the Pied Piper uh, for a vision for the LA River that is fast becoming true. And I want to acknowledge you and all of the people here in this community who believe that to be true way back when. Uh, and we put a, with a Proposition 12, uh, the largest park initiative back then, uh, in U.S. history, $100 million uh, for that L.A. River. And just a few days ago, or rather just yesterday, uh, when the EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson announced what we all thought should have been the order of the day, and that is that the L.A. River will be a navigable uh, waterway in uh, the United States, a place where we can make sure that the Clean uh, Water Act and uh, all of the laws of the land that come with that uh, will be applicable to our river, uh, allow us to make the dream that so many of you had come true. I just want to say once again to Lisa Jackson, thank you. And what a, and thank you, President Obama, if you're listening. You know, we have said to the secretaries who are here, to the administrator, that much of what President Obama campaigned on, uh, much of what they want to do around the country, whether it's moving away from an over-reliance on uh, foreign oil and fossil fuels, moving to alternative uh, energy sources, uh, cleaning up our ports, uh, recycling and uh, expanding efforts around conservation, we're doing here. And we're doing here uh, because we're doing it here because in this city uh, we have some of the most progressive uh, organizations, environmental organizations, uh, linked with community anywhere uh, in the United States. And the public support for what we've done, whether it's the LA River Master Plan, whether it's moving from 3% renewables uh, to 19 and, uh, and back down a little bit, but on our way. Uh, to moving away from uh, coal uh, in our town, whether it's the Clean Air Action Plan, uh, re retrofitting some six or buying some 6,500 new uh, clean diesel, moving away from dirty diesel trucks and reducing by 70 percent the diesel emissions, whether it's the toughest green building standards in the United States, more LEED certified buildings in any city in the United States of America whether it's the fact that we use the same amount of water today that we did 31 years ago when there were a million and a half less people, but whatever the issue is around uh, protecting the environment, whether it's the fact that we planted 280,000 trees, uh, not a million yet, but 280,000, 10 times the number that we used to, uh, this is a town uh, that's absolutely committed uh, to conserving our natural resources, to celebrating our parks and open spaces. We built 15 new parks in the last five years. And most important, partnering, partnering with our federal partners to make all of this uh, come true and to leverage what we're doing here and make it 
uh, the, the, a great example for what we could do everywhere around the country. And so I want to acknowledge uh, our federal partners who are here today. And now I have uh, the honor of introducing uh, the, uh, and I apologize to whoever wrote, whoever wrote this really long speech that I'm not going to give today, but I, you know, I thank you for your hard work anyway, because uh, I want to hear from them. Um, I now like to introduce a special person who understands the needs and the challenges uh, facing urban landscapes such as our own. Uh, she's pledged uh, to focus on core issues of protecting our air and our water quality, preventing exposure to toxic contamination in our communities, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, focusing on environmental justice and uh, making sure that we're cleaning up our environment and protecting our resources everywhere. She's the first African-American to serve as EPA administrator. She's made it a priority to focus on uh, children, the elderly, and low-income communities that are particularly susceptible to environmental health threats. And she's not only pledged uh, to do all of this, she's promised to work with stakeholders uh, to bring them to the decision-making table. Ladies and gentlemen, help me in welcoming my friend, the EPA Administrator, Lisa Jackson. Well, thanks. Thanks to President Veach. Thanks to the mayor. I told him uh, I'm going to take him with me everywhere I go with an intro like that. And welcome to the latest installment of America's Great Outdoors Listening Session. I want to thank you for joining a conversation that we're having in communities all across the United States. President Obama has asked me and my colleagues here to travel the country and meet with local residents to talk about how we can serve and protect our great outdoors in this, the 21st century. I want to let everyone know that we're videotaping today and that this will be uh, streamed, not live, but streamed later on the internet for your viewing pleasure uh, or to uh, see if you can't remember what someone said, you can check it out again uh, at a later date. Now, it was around the turn of the last century that the U.S. took some of the first significant steps to protect our great outdoors. Now, having long since filled in the open spaces of our frontiers, it's time for us to revisit the way we conserve the lands and resources that have shaped our progress. As our generation moves into the 21st century and considers the nation we will live to, leave to our children and grandchildren, America's great outdoors take on renewed importance. This is what EPA has been working on since our creation 40 years ago. It's EPA's mission to maintain the health of the outdoors through the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and our other extraordinary environmental laws in this country. The America's Great Outdoors Initiative is a chance to sharpen our focus once again, to strengthen our partnerships and add a new chapter in EPA's quest to help preserve the places that Americans cherish. But we do need your help. We're here today to learn about conservation from the people who know this area best. That's all of you, because you live here, and you work here, and you play here, and you learn here. Now, I hope you all know that the reason we've come to the city of Los Angeles to talk about the great outdoors is pretty evident. We're here because if we're going to talk about a 21st century conservation plan, it means expanding our idea and our definition of the great outdoors. This effort is as much about protecting forests and wilderness as it is about preserving and growing parks and green spaces in our cities. This morning, we tour the Vista Hermosa Park, the first public park constructed in its area in 100 years. It's a perfect example of the type of green space we want to protect and create more of through this initiative. The park's in the heart of LA's urban core, and it's a stark contrast to communities where there is no green space, where there are no parks or open areas for people to come together. In those places, we see higher levels of obesity, of economic challenge, and lower levels of community interaction. You start to pull the threads of community to the, point, to the, to the literal breaking point. No places for young people to play or residents to meet, no chance to learn about and experience and come to love the natural environment. So we're here to talk about preserving and expanding all the different varieties of great outdoors, from wide open to dense urban, and we need your help. 
I am looking forward to hearing from you today. And I'll be a little bit of a moderator up here back and forth as my colleagues and our panelists have a chance to share their thoughts with us. But my first job is to introduce one of my cabinet colleagues. Now, I can tell you a lot of things about my friend, Ken Salazar, but I just want to give you an example of some of the extraordinary things I've done with him or watched him do. I had the honor of being invited by Ken to go to the Martin Luther King groundbreaking for the memorial for Dr. King on our National Mall. It's a day I called my mother and said, you'll never believe what this job has allowed me to do today. Not long ago, I went to Ford's Theater and I met the uh, park superintendent there who had come from Frederick Douglass' house over to Ford's Theater, an extraordinary exhibit in the basement of Ford's Theater about the relationship between Frederick Douglass and our great president, President Abraham Lincoln. I've watched him initiate and complete, although he's still advocating for more money, the uh, introduction of a larger urban youth component into the National Park Service system of volunteers and paid summer helpers. And I remember reading about his reopening of the Statue of Liberty for everyone in our country to visit after having it been clo closed for so long. The last thing I'll say about Ken Salazar is that he is the voice in the administration among so many great environmentalists and conservationists who reminds us that the great and great outdoors has absolutely nothing to do with size. It has to do with value. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of Interior, Ken Salazar. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa Jackson. And let me just say, uh, Couple of things. First, uh, Antonio Villarraigosa, what a mayor you have here in Los Angeles. One of the top mayors in the United States of America. And you heard him talk about why it is that he has become that and recognized that around the country. Thank you for your leadership and for your inspiration. And to my fellow Obama Dream Team members, when you think about Lisa Jackson and her humble beginnings and what she has done to essentially rise to be the head of environmental protection in the United States of America. She is the American dream, and I can tell you she walks it and talks it every single day. And, and your, your home girl here in Los Angeles, Nancy Sutley, you know. I mean, she, she was trying to be shy as uh, Antonio, the mayor, was looking over to the left, but uh, what he was trying to signal to her is that she really is uh, in large part with uh, many of you who are here, the mother of the great restoration effort on the Los Angeles River, the Los Angeles River, and so many other things. As chairman of the, uh, the Council of Environmental Quality, she essentially oversees all of the environmental aspects of the United States of America. So Barack Obama made the right choice when he put her into that position. <laughs> And Harris Sherman, Harris Sherman, well, he was a guy a long time ago who got me involved in conservation through the Trust for Public Lands now some 30 years ago. But he oversees uh, about 192 million acres of national forests, including many of which are here along the Los Angeles River and the Santa Monica Mountains and the whole coalition there. And uh, his heart is into conservation and into youth. Give him a round of applause because he's one of the key people in making America's great outdoors possible. Now, there was a time when uh, the Army Corps of Engineers was really seen as uh, simply a flood protector and creating levees and putting concrete into rivers, and we've seen it here in LA. And uh, Joellen Darcy is really at the point of the spear in terms of uh, turning that page and uh, making sure that American rivers and waterways really are guarded for their ecological values and for the great kind of restoration that is going on. So give Joe Allen Darcy and the Army Corps of Engineers also a round of applause. Uh, I know it's supposed to be short and I will be short, but I can't help but uh, make a comment about Occidental. Uh, I was uh, speaking with uh, President Meech before, and he spoke about how this college uh, has about 40% of its people who come from minority backgrounds. When you think about this nation, uh, and, and by the way, it's very difficult to get into this school because it's recognized as one of the very best schools in the country. When you think about the challenges this nation faces with respect to uh, diversity, one can use it as a 
challenge that divides a country, or one can use it as an opportunity that unites the country. And I think that, the, that Occidental College has uh, hit the right note here, which is diversity is not only something that ought to be tolerated, it's something that ought to be celebrated because it's what's going to make America stronger in the days and decades ahead. So thank you, Mr. President, for what you do here at Occidental. And perhaps the fact that uh, President Barack Obama spent his first two years here, we were trying to check on his transcript a little earlier, but uh, it tells you that uh, anything is possible. Uh, because here was a young man, I spent time with him last year, we went around some of our uh, great outdoors, uh, and to think about his discovery of, of America, he was not born to be president, nobody gave it to him, he didn't come from regal power, he wasn't an aristocrat. He didn't know his father, he was, and yet he is now President of the United States. So thank you, Occidental, for having played a great part in his life. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me uh, comment on uh, what we are doing with uh, America's Great Outdoors. Lisa introduced it in a great way. It is so much uh, a part of uh, what we really have to do in this 21st century. When we started working together as part of the Obama team and pulling together a conference on conservation. We were thinking back to the days of Teddy Roosevelt 102 years ago when he pulled together leaders from throughout the country and said what ought to be the conservation agenda for America. And through that, he left the legacy that we have today, the national forests, the national parks, the 550 wildlife refuges and so much. But a lot has changed in those 102 years. And so when President Obama brought the people uh, together at uh, uh, the White House and at the uh, Interior on April the 16th. What he was talking about was how do we put together that conservation agenda for the 21st century? And fundamental to his approach to things is let's go out and listen to what the American people would, would like us to do. To be sure, for in fact, everybody who is here on this panel today, April the 16th seems like a long time ago because on April the 20th, we had the blowout of the Deepwater Horizon and the spill in the Gulf Coast, which many of us have spent uh, uh, long days, every single day, working to try to address uh, the issues that we are seeing in the Gulf Coast. But as I often said to the President, and I say to my colleagues, and I say to all of you, we're resolute and confident that we're gonna see this problem through. And at the end of the day, from this crisis, will actually emerge the catalyst from, for some great things for America. It will be a catalyst, yes, for a safer production of uh, oil and gas, but it will be a catalyst for a new Gulf Coast restoration effort, which the President is leading and has already announced. It will also be a catalyst, in my view, for a new conservation agenda for the 21st century, because it's important, as we look at the Gulf of Mexico today, to remember and to recognize that as we take from the Earth, it is important to return something back to the Earth. And we in the United States have not done that for a long time, so it will be a catalyst for that new conservation agenda for this country, as well as moving forward with uh, the agenda which the President has so championed, and that is to grab the whole world of renewable energy and tackling the issues of climate change. So you will see that as uh, some of the things that come from this crisis. Now let me uh, just say a quick word about the American Great Outdoors. There are, there are some key components to what, at least in my mind and my formative thoughts, uh, I think about in terms of an America Great Outdoors agenda for the 21st century, and you see so much of it here in L.A. First, there are the great urban parks of America. We have not paid enough attention to the great urban parks of America, paid attention to places like Yellowstone and Yosemite, and indeed as we should have. But the great urban parks of America are to be found in L.A., they're to be found on the Mississippi and St. Louis, they're to be found in Millennium Park in Chicago, they're to be found in uh, the New York Harbor in New York and all over this country. And so one of our great hopes as we come out of here, identifying what it is that we need to do to establish more great urban parks and what we have to do further to put our shoulder behind the kinds of great urban parks like the ones that uh, Mayor Villarregosa and so many of you here are involved in today. Secondly, rivers. For several centuries, we in the United States turned our backs to our rivers. Our rivers became the dumping places for industrial waste and for everything that you can think of. All of you have seen these rivers, whether they're tires or old cars that have been dumped into those rivers. And it's really only been in the last 
20 years where we have turned our face to the river. And we turn our face to the river and we embrace them, what we find there is not only environmental restoration and economic prosperity, but we also find that rivers become the hub for the vitality of the great cities of America because most cities were founded at the beginning around these rivers. And so that will be part of our agenda, in my view, of, of uh, America's great outdoors. Third, uh, the historic preservation aspects of what we do. Uh, cultural and historic preservation are critically important. Uh, for me and the Department of Interior, as I look at the 400 million acres which we manage, uh, I also recognize the importance of managing the historic and cultural heritage of America, whether it's the birth home of Martin Luther King in Atlanta, or whether it's the places where Cesar Chavez walked uh, through the places and fields here in California and in Arizona. That's part of telling America's story and part of getting people into the outdoors. Fourth, wildlife. Wildlife habitat is extremely important in our country, and every year we lose uh, the amount of acreage that's equal to the size of Connecticut through development. And so what happens to our wildlife as we diminish uh, the wildlife acreage that is available? So we have to do a lot more to connect up the landscapes and to connect up uh, wildlife for America. And finally, we need to identify, in my view, the great landscapes of this country. Whether it's uh, the Los Angeles River or the Santa Monica Mountains and Recreation Area or the Bay Delta in uh, San Francisco or whether it's places like the Chesapeake Bay, uh, the Everglades, the Crown of the Continent, so many landscapes which are calling out for the attention of America in a new march for conservation. So let me just say in concluding my remarks that I hope that today's listening session here in LA in the City of the Angels, in the City of Los Angeles, really is the inspiring place for us to grasp the opportunity which the President has asked us to take on together, and that is to create a future for conservation for America that connects us up to greater rink parks and to our young people. And that is what I hope we achieve here today. And it is with my absolute uh, privilege to be able to introduce to you uh, Nancy Sutley, who uh, is one of the key players in President Obama's administration, meeting with him not only in the Oval Office but in the Cabinet Room and so many other places where I have seen her work tirelessly on behalf of the people of this country. So Mayor Villarraigosa, she might have been your deputy mayor, but now in the Obama administration, she sits at the very right hand of moving forward with the new environmental agenda for America, Nancy Sutley. Thank you uh, very much. Thanks, Ken, for that uh, lovely introduction. And good afternoon to all of you. It's uh, really fantastic to be home, to be here in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, to President Veach, thank you for this uh, great, uh, your great hospitality here at Occidental. And uh, what a fantastic place to be doing this listening session. And to Mayor Viragosa, it's uh, an honor uh, to be part of your administration uh, and all the work we did and all the work that you continue to do and lead uh, to make Los Angeles a cleaner and greener place and the kind of sustainable, uh, pro prosperous city that we all know Los Angeles can and should be. So it's uh, great to be here. Look at this crowd, standing room only. Uh, maybe some of my colleagues are surprised at the response we've gotten here in Los Angeles, but I know but I'm not. I'm, I know how passionate Angelinos about, are about the places that they love. I just like people across the country, here in Los Angeles, people are proud of their parks, of their open space, of the water, of the rivers, of all the things around them. And we know people in this community are working hard to protect them and restore them in new and intelligent ways. Uh, as some, so many have said up here, Los Angeles is a place where our dreams and our imagination can come to life. And California is one of those places where great things tend to happen first. So all of the inspiring and wonderful innovations in conservation and creation of open space and restoration of places that are happening here in Los Angeles are exactly what the President had in mind when he created America's Great Outdoor Initiative and why he told us, all of us, to come out and to learn from communities like this one. We had a chance earlier today to visit some of those places and 
We often think of uh, outdoor spaces, as, as some had said, as grand, the grand national parks, these inspiring, majestic landscapes, and they can be that. And they can be grand urban parks like Griffith Park or the grand landscape of the Angeles National Forest and the San Gabriel Mountains. But many of us experience the outdoors on a smaller scale, like Vista Hermosa Park, which we visited not far from my home in Los Angeles which was a big hit from the day it opened a couple of years ago. A new park in a place that was incredibly park poor. So we're so excited to be here because we understand and know how much people crave the outdoor and crave outdoor spaces. And here in Los Angeles, we witness every day the same desire for connections to the outdoor whether it's families enjoying a picnic in Elysian Park on a Sunday afternoon or a bike ride or a walk along the LA River. For, for urban areas, for people who live in the city, outdoor spaces are a refuge from an ocean of asphalt. They provide us with a sense of peace and add quality to our lives. They give us a chance to experience nature and be around wildlife, even if it's only a chipmunk or a squirrel or a sparrow. But they're places that we can go with our families to unwind and to connect with each other. And sometimes they're the only places where kids can stretch their legs and let their imaginations run wild. 80% of Americans live in urban areas, and these pockets of outdoor space are more important than ever. There is, we all have the cherished tradition of a, a weekend trip to the park, or a camping trip, or a summer road trip that families who live in cities uh, or in suburbs can go to the beach or to a national park or a, a state park forest or campground or, or just next door to a little bit of green in our own neighborhoods. So just as we cherish these childhood memories of spending time outside with our families, we must guard these places and traditions for new generation. The conservation challenges that we face in the 21st century are complex. We know how hard it is because of pollution and development, our growing population, and the impacts of climate change that are taking a toll on our lands and waters. All of these challenges cry out for new and innovative solutions. And at the end of the day, we know these solutions will not just come from Washington. They have to come from our communities from the bottom up. They begin with partnerships among the communities, the businesses, the governments, conservation groups, and all people who care about the outdoors. So we're very happy to be here in Los Angeles to hear from you, to help us to identify new opportunities to work together on a modern approach to conservation and to reinvigorate the national conservation about our outdoors. And we want to hear from you what we can do at the federal level, either to help you succeed or to get out of your way. So that's why we're here today, and that's why we want to hear from you, and we're looking forward to this conversation with you. And your comments and the things that we hear in this session and breakout sessions will be part of our report to the president. So we look forward to it, and it's now my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, my colleague from the Department of Agriculture, Undersecretary for Natural, Resource, Natural Resources and Environment, Harris Sherman. Can't tell you uh, how inspirational the last day and a half has been as we have toured various areas of Los Angeles. We've just seen such an incredible spirit and enthusiasm and commitment to conservation, commitment to environmental protection in this great city. And so all I can say is uh, it has certainly, we've learned a lot from this and we really applaud you. And I also just want to thank you for being at this listening session. I think this is the largest listening session to date that we have had in our tour around the country. So you're really to be commended for your participation and your enthusiasm. Um, I'm very pleased today to represent the Department of Agriculture and Secretary Vilsack. Um, and my colleagues in the United States Forest Service and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Why does USDA have an interest in this? Well, we have a tremendous interest in public and private land. The Forest Service, uh, as Secretary Salazar mentioned, covers about 10% of the land mass of the United States. 
Uh, and these are very important lands, such as the Angeles National Forest next to you. Uh, the Angeles National Forest, uh, as I understand, constitutes 72% of the open space of Los Angeles County. And the Angeles National Forest constitutes 25% of the land base of Los Angeles County. So we are passionate about restoration of these lands. We're passionate about protecting wildlife. We're passionate about the importance of our watersheds, our streams, our rivers, our lakes. We're passionate about protecting the wildlife resource. And let me just say that uh, we're also passionate about the creation of outdoor recreational opportunities. Over three and a half million visitors this year in the Angeles National Forest alone. So we want to work with you, and uh, I want to impress upon you, we also have an urban program. We have an urban forestry program, and we are hiring as interns and as summer employees and as uh, conservation volunteers and as Job Corps volunteers, thousands of young people each summer, hoping to in part attract them to the importance of the natural environment. Let me also, though, focus on the importance of our private lands as well as our public lands. Two-thirds of the United States is in private land ownership. These private lands, often more than public lands, are at risk, particularly adjacent to urban areas where development and fragmentation can threaten those lands. So we are focused, uh, particularly through NRCS, with work with private landers, landowners on wetland issues, wildlife issues, protection of private forest, water quality and water quantity issues, soil erosion issues, and so forth. And our success in this is directly dependent upon our work with private landowners, but also with state governments, local governments, NGOs, private organizations, and individuals. All of these lands deserve our attention, and the interrelationship of public lands and private lands deserves special attention. Three months ago, um, we had the opportunity of meeting in the Oval Office with President Obama to discuss the Great Outdoors Initiative. And he was eager and committed to see this program go forward. And he wanted us to go out and truly get the best ideas as it relates to private and public lands, urban lands, rural lands. And as several of my colleagues have mentioned, he truly wanted this as a bottoms up effort. What do you think about these issues? We are having these listening sessions around the country. We're gonna take this information back to Washington. We're gonna prepare a report that is due to the president on November the 15th, in which we will outline what we have heard from you. And I am confident that report is gonna have an impact on the federal budget, on administrative programs and policies, on legislative initiatives, and it will have an impact on our partnership with local and state governments and the NGO and private sector as well. So this is really an important effort, and I hope today when we go to the breakout groups in particular, you will be very frank and candid about your thoughts and ideas, what is working, what's not working, how, we, how can we improve what we're doing, what are the new ideas, what are the new frontiers. That's really what this effort is all about. And I think if we all take advantage of this, it will be an enormous opportunity for us, and I think for you. So thank you very much, and now I would like to introduce my colleague, Joellen Darcy, the Assistant Secretary for the Army. Joellen. Thank you, Harrison. Uh, thank you to the Occidental College, our host today, and this is the first time for me being at this, uh, at this beautiful place, and I can't wait to get outside and enjoy the outdoors outside of here. Um, and also thanks to the mayor. I'm also gonna uh, apologize in advance to um, those who helped me prepare for my remarks because I'm gonna say something other than what's written in my speech. But um, what I should say is that all of you have been sitting here for an hour and probably, if I were smart, I would just say ditto to everything everybody else said and sit down, but I just have to say a couple of things. Um, one is that I'm, um, as part of uh, what, what Secretary Salazar referred to as the dream team, um, on this day where we're all waiting for LeBron James' announcement. Um, you know, it's a couple hours left, so sit on the edge of your seats. But um, I think the fact that, that he referred to us as a dream team is important because it is a team. 
Um, you're seeing the collaboration of all of these federal agencies, and that doesn't happen all the time. Um, we all have different missions in our agencies, but we all have one united purpose, and that is um, under the leadership of President Barack Obama to um, bring forward his vision for the Great American Outdoors Initiative and how that's going to impact all of you and impact all of the country. And as I say, our missions are, are different, but our goal is the same. We in the Corps of Engineers have uh, a long history uh, of a mission that started back in the 1700s, and that was to um, provide navigational support for all the rivers in this country. We're still doing that. We're also doing a lot more. We're doing flood risk management reduction, and we're doing ecosystem restoration. But we're doing that because we're doing it with partners. Um, since 1986, the Congress told the Corps of Engineers that all of our projects had to have a local sponsor, and that's you. We wouldn't be doing anything if it wasn't for the support and the vision of people like you in LA who can see your river now from a different perspective, and we can all work together to, to make it the vision that you see in the future. So the partnerships that we have both at the federal level are reflected in this initiative, but what we have in the local level is the only way that we can accomplish what you want us to. Um, I'd just like to take one minute to um, uh, recognize someone in the audience who probably many of you don't know. Um, the LA district is home to a great uh, Corps of Engineers district. We have the pleasure and you have the great opportunity to work with our new um, district commander, who's um, Colonel Toy. Colonel Toy is here, he, and one of the reasons he's here is because he feels like he's at home. He's from this area, and I think that he's going to provide great leadership, um, not only in the district, but for the country and for the vision, both for the great American outdoors as well as for what we can do with all of you here. So Colonel Toy is down in the front. You'll be meeting him, I'm sure, in the next, in the next couple of weeks. Um, but again, I will, I will end because we're here to listen to you, um, and you've listened to us for a while, so now it's your turn. So thank you. Okay, I think we have established that your federal government is here in full force, but before we go to you, we thought we would just get four faces, four, four random folks from the crowd, I'm kidding, to be your panelists. And we've asked them to just kick it up, to get us all to be your voice on the issues they've worked so long on. I will first go to uh, Bruce Saito. He's executive director of the LA Conservation Corps. He has a long history of working with at-risk uh, youth. <laughs> Thank you, Minister Jackson. Well, I'm here to um, help frame the discussion. So we've uh, been listening for the past uh, almost hour. So I want to just kind of emphasize and reiterate what's been said. Um, I hope the, uh, uh, Chair Sutley won't tell on me, but I was privileged to attend the DC um, press conference and rollout of the American Great Outdoors Initiative about three months ago, like some of you in the audience. And I was struck by, I'm always struck by what the president says, and I melt on every word, but he did say that, you know, this was an initiative to conserve and protect our lands and waters, um, and also engage uh, people, particularly young folks, again in the American great outdoors. And I, I don't think it was just rhetoric, I don't think it was just talk, and as you've heard from all the speakers before, um, it is genuine and real and sincere. I think the other message was that no longer would government, maybe you've heard this before, would they work in silos. And that it's, and it's evidence here by the White House participating by the Interior, by the United States EPA, and by the USDA. But not only those um, agencies um, and departments or organizations, but all of um, the um, United States government. They wouldn't work in silos, but they would work together to roll out this initiative, and, and I think it's already been said, from the president, the former organizer, in an organizer fashion. Folks were gonna hit the streets, or in this case, the parks, and listen and hear from folks. And I can t uh, testify and tell you that, again, it's genuine and true. The message is, is real by what I just witnessed a couple hours ago. As uh, I think Nancy said, it's been a long week. It's been a long couple days full of activities and events and, uh, from event to event. And the last one was a special effort to hear from about 150 or, 100 or 200 young folks from the Los Angeles Conservation Corps, from Outward Bound Adventures, from the Student Conservation Association, from local and national groups about what their interests were 
um, not just about in their communities, but what their interests were um, about the, the great outdoors. And how do you get them engaged, or how do you, in some cases, introduce them to the great outdoors? Not just for careers like the Under Set Secretary mentioned, but just to get them involved, engaged, and doing healthy and active things. And so this group um, all went and heard those young folks. Uh, they worked for about an hour, an hour and a half to develop their kind of position statements. And they listened intently. And, and the Under Secretary took notes, and he's going to share them with the rest, I believe. Um, and, and I think those, that, that characterizes or speaks volumes to uh, the effort that's being made here. So that's, um, as the Under Secretary said, is the intent of this discussion. And this group is going to listen and hear from you about your concerns, not only about just youth issues, but in, and environmental um, and a number of uh, things that are important to you, whether you're an environmental group, a business, or a local community. So, um, I, I beg of you to, to uh, uh, put your best foot forward. Um, this truly is a listening session. This is truly an incredible effort, and uh, your, your words, your thoughts, your comments are going to be well received. Our next panelist has been uh, a voice for sound planning and really thinking about ways to make uh, the city and the city government and the private sector work to establish a different outcome in our city. But I know her from the president-elect's transition team, where Cecilia Estolano and I uh, both served. And Cecilia is currently chief strategist at Green for All. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Um, once again, let me welcome our friends from Washington, um, a refuge from the triple-digit heat and humidity of D.C. to Los Angeles, which you'll note is provided perfect weather. It's not, in fact, a desert. I think you'll agree from your time here that it is a lush garden of cultural and recreational diversity. It, is, it really is a lush environment of, of inspiration. And again, as Bruce said, part of what we're supposed to do is frame the discussion. I want to talk really about three concepts very briefly. One, and all things that this administration in particular understands better than any previous administration. But I think you'll hear from this audience some extraordinary ideas about how to even refine what you're doing just a little bit better. Um, infrastructure. What I most appreciate about the Obama administration is its investment in the future of this country um, in all levels of infrastructure, whether it's transportation, a smart grid, the water system, but the other thing this administration understands is that recreation and open space is just as important a part of the infrastructure of this country. And so this is, I, I always like to think at Green for All, our mission is to create a green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty. We believe that you can have solutions that create a more livable environment while creating economic sustainability for folks who may not have had the best education, that may not have had the best life's chances. Um, and we think infrastructure investment is important. Uh, we think that what this administration is doing with this initiative is tremendous. Um, let me just put a couple of bugs in your ear about infrastructure, which feeds into the second issue of integration. Lewis McAdams was already mentioned by the mayor, a great visionary here in the city. We are very proud of the Los Angeles River and the efforts that it's taken over the last 20 plus years to bring this river back into play. And that's why when I was the mayor's chief executive officer of the Community Redevelopment Agency, we made a point of help establishing the Los Angeles River Revitalization Corporation to try to use the power of the private sector as well as the public-private public partnerships to help revitalize the river. Um, and that infrastructure of creating, as the mayor said, an emerald neck neck necklace of open spaces and parks has to happen in conjunction with other infrastructure development happening in the city, namely the high-speed rail that will be coming through the city of Los Angeles, which we're very delighted about. I think we're all delighted about the, the job creation potential, the mobility potential, the development potential, but I, I've had a number of conversations with Lewis McAdams about this point. If we don't integrate the revitalization of the LA River with this tremendous opportunity of the high-speed rail line coming through the city of Los Angeles, we will have lost the river for another several generations. So just one point. 
Second, and that speaks to integration. Again, this administration, through its, just even its Sustainable Communities Initiative, bringing together in a historic partnership, the Department of Transportation, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, an extraordinary integration of, of formerly siloed efforts. Um, commend the administration for that and would hope that the administration would also focus on integration of environmental protection and I think you're seeing that through this listening tour. Again, I want to give you one specific example as we invest in infrastructure and what we like to call rebuilding the city, the, the nation's green infrastructure, um, we need to think about the economic development and job creation potential of that. Again, I was very, very privileged to have been invited by Administrator Jackson to a water summit she convened a couple of months ago in Washington, D.C. There was great talk about the need to rebuild our sewer and stormwater infrastructure. And I'm looking at Gary Lee Moore in the audience. No one knows that better than, than our uh, chief engineer in the city of Los Angeles. But it's not just about building better plumbing. It's about building places that can actually serve a dual purpose of creating recreational opportunities and open space while we are retaining our floodwaters, rejuvenating and revitalizing and restoring our groundwater supplies. So that integration of new green infrastructure as well as seeing additional funding for cities like Los Angeles and many, many other cities who are going to have to rebuild their sewer and stormwater systems. But let's do it in a way that creates open space, parks, recreational places that can be used 300 in LA, 350 days a year, and a few days a year that they're used as flood retention basins. Um, and, and finally, inspiration. It is, it is wonderful to be sitting uh, to the left of Bruce Saito, because I think of inspiration as seeing opportunity for the future the future careers of the folks in the city of Los Angeles and, southern, and the Southland generally. And Green for All is certainly committed to that as a national level. I don't think there's any better organization than the LA Conservation Corps as taking you young people and showing them, inspiring them to new careers that are environmentally sustainable. But again, to give a couple of examples, here in Los Angeles, we have some homegrown environmentalism that is setting the standard for how you can inspire rebuilding a greener environment. And I want to call out the Neighborhood Land Trust, Tree People, Heal the Bay, and Friends, of course, Friends of the LA River, as groups that have integrated this vision of making Los Angeles greener, more livable, more breathable, and still creating space for our young people to find careers that will get them into the middle class. So let us not forget the inspiration of the next generation. And again, to the administration, thank you so much for spending days in Los Angeles away from the muggy, terrible weather and here at the perfect weather in Southern California. Thank you. Our next panelist is, uh, owns and runs a cow and calf operation and farms grapes in Monterey County. But he's here today because he is also president-elect of the California Cattlemen's Association. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Kester. Thank you, Lisa. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to address you this afternoon to share the California rancher's perspective on the president's America's Great Outdoors Initiative. My name is Kevin Kester. I'm a rancher from Parkfield, California, and the president-elect of the California Cattlemen's Association. For those of you not from California, I'd like to welcome you to California, a state that has over 34 million acres of grazed rangelands. These vast, expansive tracts of rangeland are working ranchers. They provide the public with scenic vistas, provide recreational opportunities, provide wildlife habitat, and are home to a diversity of common and threatened species. They contribute to the watershed, health, and produce wholesome, nutritious food, and economically support family businesses in many communities throughout the state. In particular, the 24 million acres of private working ranches in the state play a crucial role in buffering development from encroachment on public lands and provide the connectivity of the vast areas of open space, which is vital for animal and plant species. California cattlemen recommend that this initiative seek to follow the pattern of voluntary creative conservation mechanisms which have proven effective and are in high demand. A fundamental goal could be to enhance the funding availability of voluntary conservation easements held by third parties through this initiative. For example, my family ranch is protected from development in perpetuity. 
Thank you. With a conservation instrument held by the California Rangeland Trust, the ecological and economic value of our ranch today are ensured for future generations of my family and the American public. While the long-term stewardship and land taxes remain our responsibility, there is a long list of ranchers who are willing to permanently protect and preserve their ranches, and California cattlemen are hopeful this initiative will focus on additional funding for the voluntary acquisition of conservation easements on private working ranches rather than outright fee acquisition. A potential revenue stream to support this type of conservation would be through the Land and Water Conservation Fund by purchasing easements versus building a public land portfolio. And we can achieve the same conservation values at a fraction of the cost. However, it's imperative we look beyond preservation and may not meet the needs on all working landscapes. Therefore, the initiative should place a significant focus on voluntary opportunities. Both the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners Program and the Natural Resources Conservation Service Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which is known as EQIP, are key examples of successful programs that cost share voluntarily with private individuals to improve the natural resources. Yet the programs lack adequate funding to meet the demand. Ranchers have known for years, and research has shown time and again, that working farms and ranches can be an ecological, economical, and sustainable use of the land. Therefore, this initiative should bolster programs that have proven to be successful and where the landowner demand outstrips program availability in order to improve this nation's natural resources. For generations, family ranches have stewarded both the public and private land across this state and nation, contributing to local economies and creating healthy landscapes enjoyed by the public. It is imperative that this initiative does not negatively affect local economies or counties by taking land out of production. I and ranchers across this great nation are committed to conservation. However, it is important to recognize we do have concerns with government mandates of land use, mostly those out of Washington, D.C. <laughs> Just this year, an idea was floated for a number of potential monument designations, including some here in California. In past cases, such designations have restricted livestock grazing and other activities which have been a historic part of our nation's multiple use concepts, traditional for public lands, contributing to both healthy landscapes and rural economies. Furthermore, to efforts to alter land management without broad stakeholder input will discourage landowners who are preserving these open spaces today from active engagement in a broader conservation mission. <coughs> Lastly, there are many examples of collaboration occurring across this country, bringing together agencies, business, state and local governments, and private landowners. This initiative should help foster these types of relationships and partnerships at the local level through entities such as resource conservation districts and partnerships already in existence such as the California Rangeland Conservation Coalition. So thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions or provide additional examples where conservation and ranching are mutually beneficial to our natural resources. Our last panelist embodies many concepts that we hear a lot about, new urbanism and the ideas of sustainability in the city. She's been uh, in city government and now she's in the private sector and that makes me happy because that's where I'm gonna have to go. So. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Senior Vice President of Forest City Enterprises, Renata Sue. And stay in the federal government for the moment because it's tough in the private sector. Uh, Forest City, uh, just by way of introduction, is a national real estate development company that about 25 years changed its business model to focus on urban infill development, um, but doing so in a smart way. Um, before that was a sort of cachet, smart, sustainable development. Uh, we like to say that sustainable development has been a core value um, you know, before it was uh, you know, when you're turning off the lights uh, for our chairman. So it's something that embodies uh, our organization and is in, in reflected in every project that we build. Um, and I just want to bring a developer's perspective to um, you know, the, the conversation about balance and collaboration. Uh, we've got a projected 2 million people that are uh, projected to join our region in the upcoming decade. And we need to consider whether they live, work, uh, shop, and play while continuing to provide for our existing population needs as well. 
Um, by the way we develop and grow, significant impact, by the way we develop and grow will have significant impacts on our land, natural resources, and infrastructure systems. Los Angeles is certainly heir to a proud legacy of public conservation, but it is a tradition of robust development that has often overwhelmed the conservation of natural areas, uh, particularly on privately owned land. In particular, land use regulations intended to guide development have often put up inadvertent barriers to environmentally responsible, what I like to call conservation development. By contrast, conservation design, a design uh, technique that we use, is an integrative approach that facilitates development while also taking into account and conserving the natural landscape and the ecology of the development site. It is a strategy that has proven uh, to transcend traditional concepts of development and conservation as a, choice of either, as a choice of either or, offering opportunities for both and solutions that can be profitable for developers and encourage conservation of natural areas and systems. Collaboration and partnership is the key. Forms of collaborative partnerships are beginning to emerge as models uh, to be emulated. The partnership on the Denver, the old Denver Stapleton Airport uh, is an award-winning model of collaboration that balances sustainable development with land conservation, parks and open space, and alternative modes of transportation. Happens to be a project that Forest City uh, is the lead developer on. Um, more local examples are the Playa Vista project that tries to balance after some challenges, of course, um, good urban development, but also um, preserving natural lands and open space, uh, particularly the below and the wetlands. Uh, another uh, project that we're work watching uh, with great interest is the Tahone Ranch and the partnership that was developed with the environmental community and the developer of that project. It's clearly meeting the needs of our growing population and conserving natural open space doesn't have to be a zero-sum zero game. If developers and conservationists can be open to and bound by working in collaboration to establish the right balance unique to each development, sustainable development focused on conservation design, we believe can happen. In my experience, both in the public, the private, and the nonprofit sector, I've noted five key elements that can help pave the way for these types of public-private, public partnerships. Vision, a city must have a vision of what they are, how they want to develop, and what they want to come to meet the needs of their diverse and growing populations. And it helps to set the tone for developers seeking to build in a particular community. Two, appropriate land use strategies. Taking steps to identify where development should occur and at what density uh, helps to provide clarity to both sides, uh, particularly when you're looking to negotiate the details and the specifics of smart, sustainable development and conservation design. It definitely helps to create better solutions. Third, entitlements, particularly as it relates to CEQA at the state level and NEPA uh, more at the federal level, uh, particularly for urban infield development. Uh, it has gotten very complicated for uh, urban developers to get through the entitlement process because CEQA has been a tool to stop development, uh, not really to protect the environment. So when you have a developer that's really focused on creating smart, sustainable design that conserves open space and provides parks and natural resources, um, those projects should, um, we think, uh, help to uh, move through the process a little bit more quickly. Uh, it was said earlier by my colleague Cecilia Stellano, the investment in infrastructure. Uh, clearly, I think we've hit a tipping point in focusing on more infrastructure investment, focused on alternative modes of transportation, high-speed rail, uh, the red line to the sea that uh, the mayor has uh, moved mountains to occur, not literally, but figuratively speaking, um, the expo line, the expansion of the gold line here in Los Angeles. I mean, those are great infrastructure investments that need to occur. And again, have done so uh, with land use planning that tells developers what they want to build. I think it helps to move forward with more collaborative uh, developments that uh, help to build healthy quality of life types of communities. And third, financing. Um, I think continuing to provide public financing mechanisms such as the historic tax credits, affordable housing, and most notably um, the, with the recent Sustainable Communities Initiative, uh, funding for uh, smart, sustainable community strategy, I think will go a long way to helping uh, to build those more uh, balanced type of developments. Um, I believe that if developers and conservationists work in true collaboration with the right planning tools established, great projects can and will happen. Um, and they can provide great places to live, work, and play. You know, just on a closing thought, as I was listening to the panelists uh, this morning, the, this afternoon, um, I reflected on the founding of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, it was 44 Puebladeros, Puebladeros, my Spanish is a little rough, rusty, that traveled at great um, risk and peril uh, to themselves and to their family to land at the mouth of the LA River to found one of the greatest countries, the greatest cities in this country. 
Um, and I think listening to the collaborations and the partnerships that are established by this administration, and both at the federal and the local level, I think that we all should relish in the notion that the future for Los Angeles uh, is very bright, because I certainly do. So thank you. That's our panel. I'm going to invite our panelists to take a seat in the front row. Please join me in thanking them as they do.